On a chilly November night, in the quiet town of St. Catharines, Ontario, 72-year-old Bruce Furman is returning from his usual bike ride at the usual time. As the senior brings his bicycle inside the garage, he meets a violent demise. When Bruce Furman is found, his body is draped over his bicycle with a stream of blood flowing from his head. A bloody pipe wrench matted with hair rests on the work table beside him. blood everywhere. Who would murder this seemingly quiet, retired man? And why? As the police dig deep into the victim's startling past, they find nothing is as it seems. You'd open one door and ten more doors would open. And the truth is more surprising and disturbing than detectives could have imagined. There's not a lot of cases like this and it's kind of unbelievable. A foul conspiracy based on loyalty and greed is uncovered. You don't use your family, especially in such a despicable way. city of St. Catharines, 72-year-old Bruce Furman, a father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, is enjoying his retirement. He rode his bike daily. Yeah, he's quite active. He was a good-looking guy and just as charming as anybody you could possibly meet. Fun to be with. He was very handy. He had a 300-acre hog farm and like farmers usually they can build and fix anything. He used the garage for his wood shop, and he built a garden shed, and it looked like a, a little girl's playhouse. After farming, Bruce had become a realtor, and he met his common-law wife, Margaret Benesh, when he sold her home. They had camping, uh, they had a motor home, and uh, shopping across, across the water. But after eight years together, Bruce and Margaret are splitting up. My father was living in the basement, and Margaret lived upstairs in the house. Bruce is looking forward to settling the separation and moving on to a new chapter. I believe he had another 20 years. On the evening of November 27, 2001, Bruce and Margaret are each going about their separate lives. Margaret and her daughter Elizabeth, who is visiting from British Columbia, have gone to see Niagara Falls lit up at night and have a bite to eat. After Bruce has his dinner, he takes his usual bike ride. But there is nothing usual about the end of his evening. At 7 p.m., he returns to his darkened house and enters the garage. the street, neighbors Mark and Michelle Henderson have just put the kids to bed. We were sitting around watching uh, TV and the doorbell rang. And when I went to answer the door, um, two ladies were standing on the porch. Margaret and her daughter have come home to make a grisly discovery. They were quite uh, distraught because they had come home and uh, Bruce was uh, in the garage with a lot of blood. Niagara Emergency, do you need police ambulance or fire? Yes, I need an ambulance for the neighbors across the street. There's blood everywhere. Has anybody taken a look at him? Is he um, breathing or anything? Is he breathing? I don't know. If they don't know. Emergency personnel race to the home of Bruce Furman and Margaret Benesh. Police sweep the premises on alert for possible intruders, but the only person on site is Bruce Furman, and he is most certainly dead. Who was it that lashed out at this senior with such brutality? This is a case that will defy simple answers. Mr. Mike Bartley, I think that that was reality. 
27, 2001, St. Catharines, Ontario. Former farmer and real estate agent Bruce Furman has his evening routine disrupted permanently. When returning home from a bicycle ride, Bruce is bludgeoned with a pipe wrench in his own garage. At 8.45, his common-law wife and her daughter arrive home to find Bruce dead in a pool of blood. Detective Sergeant Kerry Harrison is appointed as lead investigator on this gruesome homicide. And there's so much information to take of a homicide, and, you know, you got to go from there. Outside the Furman house, a videographer captures the police activity, while inside, Detective Karen Mertz investigates the murder scene. The deceased uh, was laying uh, face forward, on top of two bicycles. He had one of his hands still on the handlebars of the bicycle. His head was near a sawhorse leg. And on top of that sawhorse was a bloody pipe wrench. Though no one was found in the house, there was clearly an intruder. From what they were telling us, it could have been a break and enter. It appears to be an attack from behind. Uh, nobody else is home. We needed to do a canvas of the neighborhood immediately to see if any other neighbors had seen or noticed anything that was unusual in the neighborhood. Or even if anybody else had been, you know, a victim of maybe an attempted break and enter. The team continues a thorough examination of the crime scene marked out where the deceased was located on the floor and took photographs. We bag his hands. Um, we try to preserve the evidence as best we can. They're combing that garage and they pay huge attention to the smallest amount of detail. The only mark the perpetrators have left behind is a single footprint on the back porch. It was drizzly that night, lawns were wet. Uh, back porches were damp. The evidence is being washed away even as it is discovered. There's really no tread pattern that they're able to really give us on that footprint. The evidence forensically is it's not giving us a whole lot. What is most perplexing is that no one can see how the intruder entered the garage. Detective Mike Adamchuk examines the crime scene. When we went to a look and see where Mr. Furman was, we did check for uh, signs of forced entry. There, there, there was not. Nobody got inside. The door was locked. The house was all, you know, the way they left it. Uh, the theory of a break and enter and someone being in the home, things are going to be ransacked. Things are going to be strewn all over the place. And nothing was, nothing was touched. Nothing was out of place. If an intruder had been discovered during a robbery, Murdering a senior seems an unlikely end to the scenario. It's a pretty serious stand to take to, to kill somebody. He was an older gentleman. They could have pushed him out of the way and ran by and ran out the door and probably... Oh. Then what could have motivated this savage attack? Harrison sends Detective Mike Adamchick to talk to the victim's estranged spouse and her daughter. They're still at the home of their neighbors who placed the... One one call. Elizabeth and Margaret were sitting on the couch. Um, I think they've been offered a drink by the Hendersons. They were um, quite shaken, both of them. They were they were hyperventilating. Margaret was um, in shock. She she didn't have a whole lot to say and just seemed very disconnected to what was happening. Elizabeth said she was going to be sick and and uh, had to go to the bathroom. On the front porch, police interview the women. Margaret is is an older lady. She's 70s you know she appeared to be upset and um, Elizabeth seemed to maybe be the one who was in control and trying to be strong for her mother Margaret and her daughter seem horrified by Bruce's violent death that's just beyond the realm of you know anything that you would even think of but they also talk openly about the domestic strife between Margaret and Bruce Elizabeth lived in British Columbia 
um, but she was here visiting her mom in St. Catharines uh, because her mom was going through some difficult personal um, issues. Elizabeth Gatenby has been trying to help the couple reach a separation agreement. It was several months prior that she came in and was sort of like, I guess, doing negotiations, like even splitting stuff up in the house. He was living downstairs, Margaret was upstairs, she would go up and down the stairs. Okay, we'll work this, work this, I'm trying to finalize the divorce in a fair way. But Margaret and Bruce are fighting over everything from figurines to flashlights. There was a court date, I think, on the Friday. Had the separation battle between these two seniors become so bitter that it had culminated in murder? And was the final straw another woman? He told my mother that he was seeing someone else. Not far from Niagara Falls, a shocking murder has occurred in the quiet city of St. Catharines. Bruce Furman is ambushed in his home and bludgeoned with a pipe wrench after an evening bike ride. At first glance, it seems this is robbery gone wrong. But now, police question whether the vicious murder could be the result of a marriage gone south. Bruce's separation from Margaret Banesh has been particularly bitter. Sergeant Carrie Harrison considers whether this 69-year-old woman could be responsible for Bruce's death open to everything and you know down each of those paths at the time of the murder margaret banesh and her daughter claim to have been at niagara falls to see the lights and have some dinner harrison sends detectives to check their alibi meanwhile she takes the women to the station where karen mertz will scan them for a possible blood spatter it's very difficult for someone to commit murder and not have some transfer of blood or bodily fluid onto themselves. We just want to be able to cover our bases and make sure that there's nothing that we need to be concerned with. No problem. They are totally cooperative with us. If she could tell us that she was picking up something, that's going to totally change the direction of our investigation. Nothing. No bodily fluids. No blood. Margaret and Elizabeth are clean. And when detectives return from Niagara Falls, they verify the women's story. They tell us the location where they went for dinner. The staff remember both of them, where they sat. Yes, they were there for dinner. That alibi checks out. They check the timing of the story in case the women committed the murder and then changed their clothes. An investigator did do a drive and we had a good understanding of, you know, when they left the falls and how long it would take them to get home and that was all within the realm of how it should be. Before the women leave the station, they give a routine statement recorded on videotape. When asked about Bruce, Elizabeth Gatenby tells the police that there was a dark side to the quiet retired man the neighbors saw working in his yard. According to Elizabeth, Bruce was not only trying to get every penny out of the separation, he had already moved on to another woman. He told my mother that he was seeing someone else. She made no bones about the fact that she uh, thought, you know, he wasn't a nice man for, for, the, for what he was doing and what he was putting her mother through. He said he would take her to the cleaners. There was nothing she could do about it. Elizabeth says Bruce had a very checkered romantic past. We found out like he'd had like eight other relationships, and every time it was the same kind of thing, you know. The women just like gave him whatever to make him go away. According to Elizabeth, Bruce had a habit of leaving his partners with an empty bank account. It was 78 women that he'd been married common law with that he had befriended uh, initially be a hand or divorce taking some assets with him so this is a pattern though these allegations about bruce's financial dealings are unconfirmed bruce had undoubtedly broken more than a few hearts he's made some enemies in his past with some with, with what he's done with these women there are potentially eight women out there with an axe to grind or a pipe wrench to swing when you have that many 
women involved, and I'm sure some of them were quite bitter. So we'd have to look at every single one of those people to see um, if their motive was there or opportunity was there. Detective Adam Chick will meet with the victim's family to get more insight into Bruce's history with women. When I spoke with the family, they weren't surprised. They knew what his, their father was doing. Diane Carroll says Bruce Furman's daughter. Dad wasn't a perfect person. But who is? Though Bruce had many relationships, she doesn't think her father set out to swindle the women. What he seemed to be doing was uh, not thinking about what was going to happen. You know, he'd get married and then divorced. He was somebody else afraid of, you know, and it just went on and on and on like that. Diane was hopeful about Bruce's new relationship. At his age, he should be okay now. He's found Joan, this lovely lady, and he would be fine, settle down, and that would be it. It's only when the police talk to Furman's family that they learn something shocking. According to them, Margaret Banesh had uttered death threats against their father. My dad had told me at one time that uh, if he was murdered, I would know who murdered him. He told me that uh, she had uh, grabbed a knife and swung it at him. I asked him to get out of the house. He said, I can't leave. If I leave, I'll lose everything. And he really did anyways. If threats were made, were they just angry outbursts or did they foreshadow something more sinister? Though Margaret has an alibi, police reconsider whether she could have been involved in Bruce's murder get a strong lead on, in a certain area, then the other ones are put to side. According to his son, Bruce took Margaret's alleged threats seriously enough to report them to his lawyer. She actually threw an ashtray at Mr. Furman uh, and told him that, you know, he'd be dead before she would be paying him support. Bruce stole heir to his estate. But Don Furman says his father had recently changed his will to leave everything to his children. That will that they made out disappeared and was never found. My brother in Huntsville called lawyers up there to see if anybody had it and nobody could find it. Bruce had told his children that Margaret was trying to get her hands on the will. He came home, and Margaret and two neighbors were looking in the ceiling tile of his bedroom. Tearing the place apart. He said he knew they were looking for the will. What happened to the will is a mystery. Mr. Furman was complaining that paperwork, important paperwork of his, was had gone missing and was going missing. Though police have good reason to suspect Margaret Banesh, there is nothing that tangibly links her to her ex's murder. We had a great motive, but no evidence. That's a big problem. Sergeant Harrison knows it's a big leap from divorce to murder. She's an elderly lady. You're not thinking that, you know, she could carry out something like this. Margaret's alibi is rock solid, and there was no blood spatter found on her the night of murder. If Margaret wanted Bruce dead, someone else must have done the deed. Is there somebody else stepping up to the plate for her to look after the situation? Harrison is desperate for some evidence. There's pressure. I'm feeling pressure. I'm calling the plays and we're not getting any touchdowns. It's a long shot, but Harrison starts investigating whether Furman's killer could have come in from out of sent an investigative team out to start to um, attend every hotel motel they could think of. After hitting almost every motel in St. Catharines, Detective Scott Kenny finally enters the QA on Lake Street. We asked to uh, look at who had been registering in the rooms and obtain the stack of cards. What Kenny sees will change the direction of the investigation. The name on the registration card 
Elizabeth Gatenby, the daughter of Margaret Banesh. We know she's staying at her mother's, so a huge flag goes off here. Why is she renting a motel room when she's staying with her mother? Police need to find out who occupied that room and whether there's a connection to the murder of Bruce Furman. We found that there had been a couple uh, young males staying in the room, and uh, we left uh, the room, and uh, no evidence was destroyed. The motel had no names on file for the two young men, and there is nothing in the room that identifies them. Elizabeth Gatenby has some hard questions to answer. During her initial interview, she said she came here by herself on the bus with no one else. It seems the police have caught Elizabeth Gatenby in a lie. What is the daughter of Margaret Banesh trying to hide? There's an inconsistency now, first inconsistency to um, her original story. Just 20 minutes away from Niagara Falls, the honeymoon is long over for Bruce Furman and Margaret Banesh. In the midst of their ugly divorce, Bruce has been bludgeoned in his garage. And his children claim that Margaret had threatened to kill Bruce on more than one occasion. Could she have orchestrated the murder? There is no definitive evidence. Looking for new leads, police searched the local motels on the chance that the killer had come in from out of town. They make a surprising discovery. Margaret Banesha's daughter, Elizabeth Gatenby, had paid for a motel room she was not staying in. That leads us to go back to look at the video from the St. Catharines bus station to check and see who did she arrive there with. Myself and Greg went to view the videotapes and that confirmed the fact that she had gotten off the bus with a male, stood there with that male. He had like a, uh, like a blanket around him. Sergeant Harrison wants some answers, but she tells Gatenby this interview is just routine, a follow-up to ensure nothing has been missed. She has another detective ask the question so that she and Adam Chick can listen in and assess. I'm going to ask you, first of all, to, to give me some background now. Gatenby is relaxed and talks at length about herself and her family. No, My not. boys are 25, 18, and 11. The interviewer steers the conversation towards Elizabeth's trip to Ontario without revealing that the police know anything about the boys. He talks to her about traveling, uh, you know, spending a couple days on the bus. Elizabeth met a number of fellow travelers including a kid who seemed down and out. He's got, well, I wouldn't call it a beard, and I wouldn't call it a goatee. I'd kind of call it scruff. Try it. I oh, yeah, try it. No harm. <laughs> exactly. I've been there. Scruff. Yeah, yeah it was okay. kind of scruff. If I was his mother, I would say, wipe that off. Would you get a cat or something? But it's white. So he was going to come, and he was going to try and find some work. Well, that was his mission. The youth had no place to stay, and Gatenby used her credit card to get him a then you can just pay me back, you know, they'll be square, you know, and they'll give you a room. Because if you go in there, they're going to take one look at you and go, <laughs> not happy. And, you Elizabeth's know, story seems to make sense, and it's entirely consistent with her history. She is the coordinator of a home for youth at risk. She was an ex-addict herself, and uh, she, uh, that was her mission, was to take care of homeless kids. But I love what I do. Her life's work, so to speak, was to help kids that were, you know, down on their luck. You know, that's kind of what she did. Yeah, I know. But I, the I, police I, have no way to confirm Gatenby's story. She doesn't know the last names of the kid or his buddy, or where they possibly could be now. Harrison and Adam Chick can't quite put their suspicions to rest. Sometimes you get those feelings. I don't know, it's hard to say. She was lying. She was really good. Though Gatenby is convincing, her story seems too pat and too detailed. It's called laying too much track. Everything was just too perfect. Some people, you know, tell me what they did in 30 seconds. It took her probably a half hour, 45 minutes. Sergeant Harrison keeps the interview going, hoping Elizabeth will talk her way into revealing whether she is as genuine and candid as she seems. When the conversation turns back to 
Margaret, police discover that just weeks before the murder, Elizabeth's mother had attempted suicide. She took an overdose of pills. She couldn't take it anymore. She, she assured me she was okay. She wouldn't do that again. But I talked to her a few times, and every time I'd say goodbye to her, she'd be crying. Oh, I finally said to my brother, I gotta go see her. Gatenby was afraid for her mother's health and stability. She confesses that her own stress and frustration were getting the better of her. I wished he would disappear off the face of the earth so that this would all be over. Gatenby says her shock at Bruce's violent death has been accompanied by a big dose of guilt. You never in a million years expect that that's what's gonna happen. The interview leaves many questions unanswered, but police know one thing for sure. Elizabeth had strong and ample reasons to want Bruce Furman. I felt bad if that he was actually dead. Obviously, that's going to put a flag up for me. Then a piece of fragile evidence surfaces that brings investigators closer to the elusive and astonishing truth about who killed tells investigators that he was requested to come to St. Catharines to kill a guy. Near Niagara Falls, the sleepy town of St. Catharines has been shocked by the murder of Bruce Furman, a senior who was struck on the head with a pipe wrench when returning home from an evening bike ride have discovered that Bruce had a string of ex-wives. But some follow-up reveals that none of them wanted him dead. The same can't be said for his most recent ex, Margaret Benesh, who is alleged by Bruce's family to have made death threats. So far, police can find no evidence to suggest she was involved with his killing. They have discovered some curious details about her daughter, Elizabeth Gatenby, who is visiting from BC. First, she said nothing to police about meeting a down and out kid and getting him a hotel in St. Catharines. There's something, there's, there's more to it than what she's saying. Second, Gatenby has reason to believe that Bruce was going to drive her mother to suicide. She admits there were moments when she wished him dead. I wished he would disappear off the face of the earth so that this could all be over. Sergeant Carrie Harrison assigns Karen Mertz to do a forensic workover on Gatenby's rental car in hopes that it will turn up further evidence. We examine the inside and the outside of the vehicle with fingerprint powder, and then we utilize the alternate light source. It's helping us see what we cannot see with the ambient light. She examined the car, and there is a fourth ring fingerprint on the rear door of the car. We got elimination prints from Elizabeth and Margaret. So we knew that fingerprint wasn't theirs. Forensic detective Terry Smith will use an automated computer system to see if the print belongs to a known offender. The Canadian database is upwards of 4.3 million sets of fingerprints. So 43 million individual fingers if you will the odds of a match are slim to none it's a rental car so the chances of see we were overly excited finally carrie harrison gets the break in the case that she's been waiting for the turning point was running this fingerprint the one fingerprint is what was start the ball rolling the print is matched to a known criminal, and he lives in Kimberley, British Columbia, not far from Elizabeth Gatenby's hometown of Trail. The RCMP are waiting for him when he returns from his trip to Ontario. What is shocking is that this criminal is just a kid, a young offender who must remain anonymous. He's a 17-year-old kid, very much into the marijuana.
feeling of that community. Three days after the murder, detectives from St. Catharines, Ontario, fly to Kimberley, B.C. to confront the young offender with the fingerprint evidence. He tells investigators that um, he was requested to come to St. Catharines to kill a guy. The guy he was asked to kill was Mr. Bruce Furman. When investigators ask who hired him, they get an answer that is more surprising and bizarre than they could have expected. Byron, son of Elizabeth Gatenby, who lives and works in Whistler. The young offender says that he was hired by the 18-year-old son of Elizabeth Gatenby and grandson of Margaret Benesh. This is the turning point. Byron Gatenby is arrested in Whistler, B.C., where he ekes out a living as a prep cook. Detective Adamchik flies out to interrogate him, but he does some background checking before the interview. I went to where he lived. He was crashing on someone's couch. Uh, interviewed people he was, were, were hanging out with. Couldn't believe that he was arrested for first-degree murder. Most people consider him quite a gentle person. I did a history of any police that Byron had and we found some indications that he had a very very tough childhood. Elizabeth Gatenby has mentioned that she had a serious drug addiction when Byron was young. What kind of an upbringing did he have? What kind of a life? Like was Elizabeth really a mother to him? Byron has had problems with drugs and alcohol himself. In Whistler, BC, the Police grill Byron. It was a, a long interview. Um, talking things. Byron makes a one-way trip back to St. Catharines, where Harrison and the team ratchet up the pressure. I think at some point he realizes the jig's up and he finally comes through with the truth. On December 9, 2001, Byron makes a confession on tape. He tells police how he and the kid Kimberly lay in wait for Bruce Furman. At precisely 7 o'clock, Bruce Furman comes through the door, just in time for his usual evening television show. The young offender was standing behind the door. The door closes right there. Pops him. Wait, pops him with what? Uh, a wrench of some sort. He stumbles down, falls over his bike. Again. And that would be Byron's cue to come out of the tool room where he would potentially strangle him. I give him a boot, give him a kick, and, uh, and I looked at him, I actually looked at him, and I just jammed up, couldn't do anything, couldn't move. I was saying, finish it, do it, something to that effect. And uh, I couldn't do it. The young offender finishes the job. Give him a couple more shots. want to know how far this conspiracy to commit homicide extends. Did Byron act alone? Or did the matriarchs and Byron's family mastermind the murder? There's not a lot of cases like this. It's kind of... It's crazy. To get the answers, Detective Adamchik puts the pressure on Byron. I told him, I said, you know your mother's using you. You know that. And you're gonna rot in jail and she's gonna get away with this. And Harry put his head down. He said, I'm going to go to hell for this. And he looked at me and he just gave it all up. The truth is an unsettling tale of blood loyalties. For Byron, the murder was all about protecting his grandmother. She was living with Bruce Furman as a common law. He was threatening her physically, emotionally. The only thing that was really close to him still was his, was his grandmother, Margaret, that he really, really cared about. I think, you know, he truly wanted to help his grandmother. And, 
indicated that, you know, he was abusing her and he was to take all of her money and, and sort of built up this, this whole thing. He was manipulated by a master of manipulation. That's what he was done. And his own mother. Elizabeth Catenby asked her son to murder Bruce Furman. And it was uh, decided that he wasn't going to let him take, uh, take everything. Who, do, who decided that? To stop this? Mother and I. So, I uh, made the trip to come out here to, uh, to kill him. It's almost inconceivable to think that mother would bring her own son into this situation. I've seen some pretty weird things, but for I've never seen that when you, you know, get your own child to, to kill somebody. Elizabeth encouraged Byron to hire someone to help do the job. He uh, found the young offender he, who he knew like from the streets. He was a, a drug user. With Byron and the other teen conscripted as assassins, Elizabeth takes care of the logistics. She arranged like all the bus tickets to be picked up. She had code words for what, when they were supposed to do things. Bought them one-piece uh, industrial suits, gloves. The boy on the bus with Elizabeth is actually her son. The young offender arrives a day later. Elizabeth gets the boys a motel in St. Catharines. But they move to Niagara Falls on the day of the murder. Elizabeth takes her mother and they go um, to Niagara Falls. They park the car in the lot of this hotel. She leaves the keys in the back door handle of the car. That's the understanding. So then the boys can now come and take the rental car. Byron and the young offender will use the rental car to drive to St. Catharines to kill Bruce Furman. Elizabeth gave them his schedule. He was by the minute. They knew when and where he was going to be. They pretty much know exactly what time they have to be in that garage. They went, got the key, let themselves in, and waited for him. Afterwards, the boys drive back to Niagara Falls and park outside the restaurant where Elizabeth and Margaret are finishing dinner. So Elizabeth knows that they've returned. She, she, she came out and I, uh, I told her it was done. But, uh, yeah, Grandma didn't have to worry about him anymore. And Elizabeth gives some. And when Elizabeth and Margaret get home, they make the discovery they make. You know, immediately go across the street where Elizabeth puts on a, an Academy Award performance and we start rolling. No one but Elizabeth knows if she acted out of love for her mother or with an eye towards her own inheritance. And if Bruce was out of the picture, then her mom would have everything and eventually maybe that would carry on down to her. When Adam Chick arrests Elizabeth Gatenby, she is as cool as ever. Told her she was under arrest for murder. Didn't flinch. I think she was so confident that uh, she was untouchable. As for Margaret Banesh, her grandson denies that she had any involvement with the murder. Grandma never knew what was going on. She never had a clue. Even if she was involved, I don't think Byron would turn his grandmother in. But the police don't know where the money for the hit was supposed to come from. Elizabeth didn't have any money. Byron didn't have any money. But the money had to come from somewhere. That's one of the mysteries. Where did the money come from? But nothing could be brought towards Margaret. We definitely tried to look at banking information and banking accounts. Um, but, there, you know, we weren't able to find anything. There is never any evidence that Margaret Banesh conspired in Furman's death. Many of the investigators feel that she may have um, but the way we look at it is you know call your first witness we can't there was nothing nothing and we looked at everything there was nothing that we could um, find to prove that she had knowledge Elizabeth Gatenby pleads innocent to the charge of first-degree murder this mother and youth advocate claims she simply wanted the boy 
to scare Bruce Furman, not kill him. But Gatenby is found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Elizabeth's son, Byron, pleads guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and serves six years. The 17-year-old who bludgeoned Bruce Furman takes a plea for first-degree murder. He is given just six years in prison, the maximum youth sentence. We're getting the people responsible for this homicide. You know, that's a, a relief, but it's such a tragic, such a tragic story. Margaret Banesh continues to live alone in the home she shared with Bruce Furman. It bothers me that she stays there and that anybody would stay there knowing that a person was murdered. Or was murdered and by your own daughter and, you know, grandson. I can't imagine living in a house like that. I don't know how she does it. For more information, go to myviva.ca forward slash murder she solved. Thank you.